the biggest difference between the banks and working with someone like myself is that a lot of banks really don't understand how to read tax returns. And they really should know how to, but they don't. So there have been many situations where clients who consider themselves VIP with their quote-unquote big bank or their bank, they have come to me after the fact just astounded that they could not get a mortgage from their bank. And we've gone through their tax returns. Sometimes they're very thick tax tax returns. But we've been able to extract the correct qualifying income and ultimately close those loans. Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset Show. This is a podcast about the financial, money, and recreational mindset needed to successfully plan for and live your best life before and through retirement. Let's dive into today's show. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset Show and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Warren Goldberg. He's the president of Mortgage Wealth Advisors and a certified mortgage planning specialist. He also is a published author. Warren is a recognized mortgage expert who is frequently sought after by homebuyers, realtors, CPAs, and attorneys for his knowledge, advice, and guidance. Warren has a reputation for developing long-term relationships with his clients and for staying in touch long after the closing. His clients regularly express their trust and appreciation by recommending friends and family. Well, I am here with Warren Goldberg from Mortgage Wealth Advisors. Thanks for joining us today, Warren. Thank you very much for having me, Larry. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. We've been colleagues and friends for a great number of years, worked together on mortgages, and I know that your baby is Mortgage Wealth Advisors. So how did Mortgage Wealth Advisors come to be? Well, Larry, I've been in the mortgage industry for almost 30 years now, and after the crash, I was very disillusioned by how many People were still in my industry that really were not professionals. I've always felt that financial services should never be sold to people. They should always be matched to the needs of the consumer. So I wanted to create a company where the mortgages were not just sold to someone based on the typical rate that people think that they're shopping for. I wanted to ensure that the mortgage was able to be implemented into the overall financial plan so that the borrowers truly got the most bang for their buck. So I guess what you're saying is similar to related to financial services to some degree or wealth management, where we talk about brokers and how they're commissioned salespeople versus folks that work for a registered investment advisory firm like we are, where we have to act as a fiduciary. So is that like a similar thing that you were looking to do in your industry? It's a perfect analogy. That's exactly what I was trying to do. I remembered back when I was a kid, my dad would get these phone calls during dinner time from these stockbrokers who knew nothing about my father. They only had these stocks that they were looking to sell. They were trying to make them sound as attractive as possible, but they did, had no idea whether it was even appropriate for my father's situation. That's what I was seeing in the mortgage industry. And frankly, I still see that a lot, especially with the big box banks. They're really just interested in selling product. That's not what I wanted. And that's how I've built my business so that the culture of my company has been to have that fiduciary responsibility to my clients and ensure that what we do complements the financial plan that they have. Sure. I agree with you. And that's why we operate the way we do. And I know, knowing you for a long time, I know that education and staying on the forefront of everything that's going on in your industry is very important to you and staying top of your game. And I know that, and in your introduction, we talked about you being a certified mortgage planning specialist. What exactly does that mean? If I'm looking for a mortgage, what does a certified mortgage planning specialist mean? And why is that important for me to understand as I'm going through that process and looking for somebody with that designation? Well, similar to your industry where financial advisors who have more education, they're able to get these designations that give them more credibility. And of course, the additional education that people with these designations have that allows them to give better advice, it's very comparable in my industry. The certified mortgage planning specialist designation simply means that I have passed the courses that are required that essentially allow me to look at someone's financial situation holistically. We don't just 
look at the mortgage. We don't just make sure that they qualify for the mortgage. We're looking at their overall financial plan, the plans that, frankly, people like you have put together to ensure that what we do complements that overall financial plan. I use the analogy or I use the example that if financial services or financial products are not coordinated, then they're pulling in different directions. Ultimately, we want the mortgage to complement the plan so that borrowers are maximizing their tax deductibility, that they're freeing up cash flow, and ultimately that means more money that they can invest with people like you. So just to kind of wrap it up with a nice bow, so to speak, I think what you're saying is that the certified mortgage planning specialist gave you an extra level of education, but it also kind of signifies a different thought process of how to look at things and how the mortgage interacts with everything else that you're doing in your financial life. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Nail on the head. So you mentioned a little bit earlier, big box banks, right? So why, and I know just from experience with our clients, I know even myself, people have a tendency when they think about mortgage or buying a house or a financial product like that, they immediately think about their bank. And that tends to be their first phone call. Now, I know you don't want that to be their first phone call. And what I want you to have the opportunity to do is tell us, why would somebody, what are the benefits of somebody using a mortgage advisor like yourself versus going to one of those big box banks that you refer to? There are so many. How much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you could, uh, you know, hone in on the top three reasons. So reason number one, again, we look at their overall financial life holistically. We're not looking to just sell a product. We're going to make sure that whatever mortgage we provide, whether they're purchasing a home, looking to refinance for some reason, or even reverse mortgages, that the mortgage is going to complement their financial plan. They're going to get the maximum benefit from it, that the payments, if it's a forward mortgage, like a purchase or refi, that those payments are going to be comfortable based on their budget and lifestyle. Going to the banks, they're going to qualify you, hopefully, for a mortgage. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit your budget and lifestyle. We want to make sure that it does so that you're not house rich, cash poor, and just living to make those mortgage payments. The process that we've put together is very concierge. There's a lot of handholding and education. The process when we work on it is a lot smoother and efficient. And frankly, the buck stops at my desk. Okay. As president of the company, you're not dealing with dozens of different people in different departments throughout the country. You could always reach me directly and we get things done very smoothly and efficiently. The best part of the overall process is that you pay nothing more. The rates that we provide to our clients are the same as if they had gone to the big box banks or quote unquote their bank. The closing costs are no different. So borrowers are not paying any more in rate or closing costs, but they're getting all the advantages that I have discussed. Would you agree that that's a misconception to some degree? I find that people have a tendency to think that if they go to a mortgage advisor like yourself, that there's going to be additional costs, additional fee layered on because of your services. True. It's a very big misconception. And frankly, the mortgage broker industry has gotten a bad rap after the real estate crash of 2008. There was a lot of blame to go around. Some of the mortgage brokers did things that they should not have done. A lot of the big box banks were doing the same things. And and then there were others who also shared the blame. And of course, you can't paint with a broad brush. Not all mortgage brokers are wonderful. Not all big box banks are terrible. It really depends on the situation. But in general, when you're dealing with a competent, qualified, and reputable mortgage broker, you are not going to pay any more than if you were to go to, quote unquote, your bank or your credit union. Right. So I think one of the benefits of using an advisor like yourself for the mortgage versus a bank, which you didn't mention, which I think is a huge benefit, is the fact that if you go to one of those big box banks that you reference, if you don't fit in their box, their profile, what they're looking for and who they're looking to lend money to, you may not be a good fit for them or you may not get the rate that you potentially should because maybe they'll charge you a higher rate in order to kind of jam you in that box. One of the benefits I found over the years with somebody like yourself is you basically do all that due diligence up front to find out about 
out their facts, their circumstances, their goals, and their objectives. And then you look at all the available banks out there and you kind of find where that person is going to fit most appropriately so that they're not wasting their time. They go to the bank and they don't fit that box and the bank says, hey, you're not a good fit. They basically have to start that process all over again. With you, you're kind of doing that legwork for them. And if for some reason it doesn't work out with the first institution, you have backups and they don't have to start from the beginning. Am I right about that? You've raised a very good point. Prior to the crash of 2008, I used to tell people that there were 51 flavors of different types of mortgages. After the crash, a lot of those products disappeared and we were down to really just vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, maybe mint chip and Rocky Road. I love Rocky Road, by the way. (laughs) I'm a mint chip guy, sorry. So since 2008, things have continued to evolve. Some new products have come out. We're still not up to 51 flavors. However, the biggest difference between the banks and working with someone like myself is that different banks may have the same product. Let's just take 30-year fixed. However, some lenders tend to work better for self-employed borrowers. Other lenders are good for co-ops, if you were buying a co-ops, where most lenders uh, may not do co-ops. And then different banks have overlays in terms of how they underwrite. For example, you're buying a house where there's a deck in the backyard, and maybe the seller has represented that the deck is not legal, they, they never got a permit for it or a certificate of completion, some lenders won't touch it. Other lenders really don't care about those things. But especially for clients who may have complicated tax returns, maybe they're self-employed, maybe they're not, maybe they have a lot of passive income. They're retired and they're getting all of their income from investments and distributions. A lot of banks really don't understand how to read tax returns, and they really should know how to, but they don't. So there have been many situations where clients who consider themselves VIP with their quote-unquote big bank or their bank, they have come to me after the fact, just astounded that they could not get a mortgage from their bank. And we've gone through their tax returns. Sometimes they're very thick tax tax returns, but we've been able to extract the correct qualifying income and ultimately close those loans. Yeah. By knowing who the best fit would be in those cases. Knowing the best lender for their situation and knowing the underwriting guidelines and how to read tax returns. A lot of underwriters do not know how to read tax returns. They know how to follow the directions and take numbers out of certain boxes and put it on their spreadsheets, but they don't understand the big picture. And sometimes we need to explain that big picture. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest benefits of working with somebody like yourself. But let's pivot for a second. One of the things that we're, our listenership is in a lot of cases are also younger people and they may not have experience with having a mortgage at this point, but they're looking to have one. What are some steps that first time home buyers should take before looking to buy a home? Because My understanding is there are certain things that you should start thinking about in advance. You don't want to just go, okay, I'm going to go buy a home and get a mortgage. You really want to plan that out a little bit and make sure that, like you said before, your financial picture is going to be one that the bank is comfortable with and comfortable with making that loan. So are there steps that if I'm looking to buy a home that I should be starting to think about and working towards in order to make that process or the mortgage? mortgage process easier as a first-time home buyer. Certainly. I'm going to use a story, Larry, that you told me many years ago. You told me about a prospect that was referred to you. The prospect called you on the phone and said, I need to get in to see you. I need to get in before Wednesday. Why before Wednesday? What's going on? Really, I'll tell you all about it when I get there. The guy comes in and he says, I'm handing in my retirement papers on Thursday, so I need to start doing some retirement planning today. And you looked at him astounded and said, I can't do any planning for you. Now we're just reacting to what you have. You should have come to me 20 or 30 years ago to do the planning. True story, by the way. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) So in the mortgage process, preparation is key, just like when you're doing financial planning. If you are a first-time home buyer, if you're a fifth buyer, you know, you're buying your fifth home, it is best to start preparing at least six months in advance. What do I mean by preparation? Talk to a trusted mortgage advisor. Let them run your credit. Let them analyze your income documents, your asset documents, et cetera. It is much easier to address molehills that may come up during that process six months before than to address the mountains that they've become when you come to the mortgage person after you've signed contracts. And now they can only react to what you have. 
And you also, at that point, don't have time to adjust or fix or exactly. you know, put yourself in a better position. Six months plus before, you have that ability and time on your side to maybe make some adjustments. Exactly. So it may be a credit issue. Maybe there's some minor issue on credit that could be easily resolved and can raise your credit scores enough points to improve your interest rate. Maybe it is earning your income. I can't tell you how many people I have spoken to or heard about from their attorneys or from their CPAs or financial advisors. And they call me and they say, I decided to quit my job and open up my own business in January. And I'm doing so well that now in August, I want to buy a house. And I tell them, I'm sorry, you should have spoke to me in December before you quit your job. You have to have a two-year history of self-employment before we can use that income to qualify. So you know, preparation is key. Even if it's just having a detailed conversation and allowing someone like me to provide you with some advice, it goes a long way. Yeah. So I think the important takeaway here is if you're a first-time home buyer thinking about buying a house, 12 months eight months, nine months, somewhere between six and 12 months, you really should start the process of looking into where you're at and where you need to be in order to make that a successful process. It's a free phone call and the benefits would astound you. Yeah. And I would imagine that applies to first time home buyers. And I think in many cases, as you become more acclimated to purchasing homes and comfortable with the process, that makes it easier on the second or third or whatever additional real estate purchases you have. But at the same time, I think that you would agree that there are always, that there are important factors that somebody, if I'm looking for a mortgage, whether it's my first home, my second, third, whatever it may be, there are important factors that somebody looking for a mortgage should be aware of. What are some of those factors, whether it be from me personally on my file side to factors for the type of mortgage that I'm looking to go for? What are some of those primary factors that I should be aware of? Are you talking strictly? from the mortgage perspective or from shopping for a house? Well, I think let's keep it to the mortgage process. What do I have to be aware of if I'm going out? I'm going to be buying a piece of real estate, whether as a first time or subsequent owner. What are some things, and I'm going to need a mortgage for the property. What are some of those key things that I should be aware of no matter when I'm looking to do that? When I am consulting buyers, first time home buyers, six months or 12 months prior to them starting to look for a house, one of the biggest factors that I ask them to analyze is their budget. The banks will still qualify you very often for more than what you may feel you could afford. But I can talk to two different couples with identical incomes and based on their budget, their lifestyle, whether they have kids or not, whether those kids are healthy or special needs, they're going to have very different budgets and they're going to have very different perceptions as to what they feel they could afford every month. So I tell people, let's start with what you feel you could afford each month for a housing payment and then work backwards into the size of the mortgage, real estate taxes, the price of the house, et cetera. I would say that's number one. So that's an interesting point. So what you're saying is, for all our listeners out there, just because the bank approves you for the mortgage doesn't mean that that mortgage is right for you. Amen. Okay. Because I think, and maybe you agree, disagree, that's probably one of the main reasons we saw what we saw in 08, because people were getting approved for mortgages that otherwise they probably shouldn't have been approved for. Despite what politicians and the press would lead you to believe, there were a lot of borrowers out there that shared the fault of their own demise. Right. So step one is to make sure or figure out on your terms what you feel comfortable paying on a monthly basis for your mortgage, factoring in taxes and insurance, because even when the mortgage is gone, those two things will still be there, right? And then looking at what the bank is going to ultimately approve you for. Correct. Correct. Banks, I'm not so interested at first in what the banks may qualify them for. I want to make sure that what they feel they can afford will ultimately correspond to a decent sized mortgage and price range in the areas that they're looking for. Now, sometimes people are unrealistic. They may feel that maybe they can only afford a relatively modest payment, which unfortunately here on Long Island may not even be possible for them to purchase. And then I talk to them about exploring their budget. What are they spending money on right now that maybe they don't necessarily need to spend money on? Uh, where could they make certain cuts that for the greater good would allow them to afford more? And then, of course, I talked to them about the tax benefits of homeownership as well. Even with the new tax laws where the real estate taxes that they can deduct are limited, 
there are still significant deductions where they can itemize based on the interest that they're going to write off, real estate taxes, et cetera. Right. I think you hit the nail on the head. The biggest factor is making sure that whatever mortgage you're taking or whatever house you're looking for is going to fit into that price range and that budget that's going to fit your needs and not put you in a difficult position. This is the Midland Money Mindset, so let's shift to mindset for a second, right? One of the things that we quite often run into are people who are in their 40s or 50s or even 60s or 70s who either still have a mortgage or are looking to buy something. And a lot of times the mindset is, hey, I'm 50, 60, 70. I would never go for a 30-year mortgage. Does that make sense? I should get a 10 or a 15. Can we talk about the mindset there? Does Whether you have a 15-year, 30-year, or even 40-year mortgage that they have available, does that make a difference these days based upon your age? Is there any correlation between the two? Not necessarily. You know, there's really no rule of thumb in that area. Again, the advice that I would provide is going to be tailored to that specific person. That said, Americans tend to have this mindset where they want to pay off their mortgage and own the home free and clear. There are times that makes sense. There are times that it doesn't. However, most people do not understand the subconscious reasons as to where that's coming from. So Larry, I know you know this. Most people may not necessarily know this, but you know we've all grown up with grandparents and great aunts and uncles who over the years have banged into our psyche, make sure you own your house, make sure you pay off your mortgage. The bank can't take the house away from you if you pay off your mortgage. And that stems from the harm that a lot of these older generations faced during the Great Depression. Yeah, it's like a depression mentality. It's a depression mentality, exactly. If for those listening to this who may not necessarily know what I'm talking about, probably everyone has seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart says, Bob, I can't give you your money because it's in John's house. And John, I can't give you back your money right now because it's in uh, Dan's farm. Back then, when people brought their money to the bank, the bank held it on deposit, and then they took that same money and they lent it out to people getting mortgages on their homes and farms. But that's not how it works anymore. Now there's a big industry with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, national uh, guidelines and whatnot, which if we had the time I can go into. But ultimately, this mindset of paying off the house was due to the fact that a lot of people back then had their homes foreclosed, not because they weren't making the payments, but because of the run on the banks, the banks were short of funds and they needed those funds to give back to depositors. The mortgages back then had those clauses that allowed them to collect if they were running low on money. Right now in the industry, that no longer exists. So how does somebody, whether they're 40, 50, 60, 70, what should be the primary driving factor for them to determine what length the mortgage should be, whether it's a 15 or 30 or even longer than that? Is there a driving factor? Because I've seen 70-year-olds get 30-year mortgages and people are like, they're going to pay it off when they're 100? They're, you know, are they going to even be around? But there's got to be a reason, right? Why would a 70-year-old get a 30-year mortgage or a 60? What's the driving factor that dictates how long the mortgage should be? The driving factor should be their overall financial plan. So what I will do with these clients who may come to me looking for a 10-year or a 15-year or whatever the case may be, whether they're 90 or 50, I'll discuss with them what their future plans are. If they're 50 and they plan to be working for the next 30 years, a 30-year fixed may not be a bad idea. If they're looking to retire in the next 10 or 15 years and they plan to stay in place or maybe even sell the house and move, but they want that equity, then we'll discuss those mortgage payments and see if those mortgage payments for the shorter term make sense. However, with rates being so low, I'm a big fan of arbitrage. If you have the extra money to make those higher payments, very often it makes more sense to invest that money for the next 15 or 20 years rather than just dump it into the equity in the house. Because if you compare the payments on a 15 versus let's say a 30, and if you take the 30 year mortgage, take the difference in payments and invest it over time, Larry knows that over decades, the market has typically returned an investment of around 9%. Okay, give or take. Year to year, it could be higher or lower, but on average, the markets tend to over time return about 9%. But mortgage rates right now are at 3% or even 2.5%. So if you took that extra money and went for a 30 year mortgage and invested it, 
15 years from now, you would likely have enough money in that account to pay off the mortgage if you wanted to, and then have a significant amount left over as well. So I think what you're saying is it's really heavily dependent upon what that person's facts and circumstances are, what their situation is going to be looking like in the over the next 10, 20, or 30 years, and what their budget and what their cash flow would support in terms of the mortgage would really drive how many years they should end up taking. Absolutely. Absolutely. The only generic advice that you're going to hear is from those pundits on TV, which you should never listen to. (laughs) So listen, you mentioned in the last response about rates at all-time lows currently. So, I mean, what does this mean? We're hearing rates at all-time lows. They're the lowest they've been in decades. What does that mean for those people looking to take a mortgage? How does that directly translate to them? Well, lower interest rates will typically mean lower payments based on the same loan amount. It also means for those people buying a home that the home purchase will typically be more affordable, even though values have been appreciating at a record pace. We are in a very hot market right now. We're definitely looking at a seller's market and any house that goes on the market, if it's a decent house and it's accurately priced, and I'll italicize and underscore accurately priced, they're flying off the shelves. Many people are sitting on the sidelines saying that values are going up too much and we can't afford. And I tell them, I sit to them and I ask them this question. I say, if you were to wait six months or a year to purchase, thinking you're going to save up more money, are you going to be able to save up more money than what these houses are appreciating over that course of that year? And typically the answer is no. So I tell them right now, we know what we're looking at. We know what the rates are right now. We know what the prices are right now. A year from now, values may be up and rates may be up you're probably better off buying now rather than waiting. Now, again, doesn't mean that that advice is going to fit everyone. It really depends on their specific situation. Right. But the rate means that they're either going to be able to potentially get maybe more house for the same monthly budget, or potentially they will have a lower cost of that loan over time because of these lower rates, right? Which will give them the cash flow to be able to do other things with their money, like invest it for the future. Right. And then what about people who have a house, they have a mortgage, we hear about a lot of refinancing going on because of these low rates. Is there a typical rule of thumb per se that if my rate is, the difference is 1% or 2%, is is there a rule of thumb that if I could refinance and reduce my rate by X percent, that that's something I should look at? I'm so glad you asked that question. The answer is no. (laughs) People tend to hear these things or read it somewhere that unless you can drop your interest rate by 2%, it's not worth it. It is so not true. If you have a million dollar mortgage and you can drop your interest rate by a half a percent, chances are you're going to be saving a significant amount of money. If you have an $80,000 balance and you wanted to refinance for the same remaining term of years, even 2%, it may not be worth it. Then again, in uh, Florida, let's say, or Georgia, where the closing costs are less than New York, that 1% interest rate, let's say, uh, reduction may make sense because it's costing you less to get the mortgage. Here in New York, the 1% drop may not be enough. It all depends on your unique situation, whether you're looking to shorten the term, whether you're looking to extend the term, whether you're looking to lower your payments. There's so many different variables that go into the decision, and I will try to walk the borrowers through that decision-making process so that they truly understand. So basically, if you are considering refinancing, there are so many factors involved that don't follow the rule of thumb or rules of thumb. Contact somebody like Warren or a mortgage advisor and see if it makes sense for you and your situation, because you may not be the rule of thumb, I guess. That is correct. Don't just listen to the salespeople that are in the boiler room calling you at home saying, hey, rates are low and you would benefit from refinancing. You may, but you certainly may not. Right. So listen, Warren, it's been a lot of fun and we end every show with the same question. So we're going to give you this question. Question also, like everybody else, and it is the Midland Money Mindset. What did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? That's the hardest question you've asked me. <laughs> the joy that I get in my life tends to come from well, a number of different places. Having a family and friends to be able to spend time with, which is more difficult these days where we ought to you know, be separate, but being able to spend quality time with people that I love gives me joy. And it's something that I've learned many years ago. When talking to a lot of these first-time home buyers, I tell them, I've had the big house with the country club backyard, and I've had the smaller house that was much more manageable. 
Having lots of toys is not necessarily going to bring you joy in your life. It is the experiences that bring you joy. And if those experiences are spending time with friends and family or traveling or just walking in the woods and meditating on your own, that's what brings joy to people's lives. It's not uh, how many toys you have. Agree. Well, Warren, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for being a guest. If people want to learn more about you and Mortgage Wealth Advisors, where can they go to find that out? You could always look on the website. The website is www.mortgagewealthadvisors.com. And the office phone number is 516-584-7218. Warren, it's been a pleasure having you on the Midland Money Mindset. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it and make it a great day. I had a great time. Thanks so much for inviting me. I want to thank Warren for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset Show. Warren has helped thousands of clients own their homes, refinance their mortgages, restructure their debts, and invest in real estate. He's a true consultant and a gentleman. To learn more about Warren and Mortgage Wealth Advisors, be sure to visit MortgageWealthAdvisors.com. Thank you for joining us this week on the Midland Money Mindset make sure you visit our website at midlandfinancial.com and be sure to smash the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. We encourage you to help others find our valuable content. And listen, please don't keep us a secret. You can also schedule an Is There a Fit call right from our website or by using the link that you'll find in the description section of your podcast player or app. Be sure to join us for our next episode to learn more about the mindset needed to successfully plan for and live your best life before and through retirement. The opinions voiced in the Midland Money Mindset Show with Lawrence Sprung are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy ensures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Guests on the Midland Money Mindset Show are not affiliated with CWM LLC.